Hi everyone, I'm thrilled today to be in conversation with uh, Professor Nicholas Slate and uh, Mr. Ram Chandra Guha. Um, we're talking today about this fascinating biography by uh, Professor Slate called uh, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, The Art of Freedom. This is the book and I found this book particularly fascinating uh, as Mr. Guha puts it that Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay was perhaps the greatest woman of modern times, and we know so awfully little about her. Uh, and I'll come to that uh, in just a bit, but uh, Mr. Goha, I want to start with you first, because um, this book is, of course, a part of the series called The Indian Lives that you are editing and curating. This is the third book of the series. Uh, but very quickly, I want to go back to your own book, which I found so, so, so fascinating and almost warm and fuzzy to read on the relationship between an editor and a writer. The book is called The Cooking of Books. And um, I almost found that book, the relationship between a writer um, and their editor, how you describe it to be almost romantic. Uh, but I want to ask you that, you know, you're right that good editors combine arrogance and selflessness. Now you are such a prolific writer yourself. How does a writer that prolific go on to become a selfless editor? How is that transition? You know, I have um, uh, done a fair amount of editing. That's a very important question because I began as a writer. And mm. I was lucky as a writer to have some remarkable editors. Rukun Nadwani, uh, who's the subject of my new book, but also someone who deserves to be much better known in the Indian literary world. The late Krishna Raj, who was the editor of the Economic and Political Weekly, India's leading social science magazine, where I published first, some of my first quality essays, and he was a wonderful editor too. And uh, when I was in my 40s, mid 40s, after I published a few books myself, I thought a good way of uh, giving back to younger writers what I had learned from editors was to help them produce their own books, and uh, which is why I co-founded the New India Foundation in 2004, yeah. which published 33 books. And now yeah. uh, uh, I'm working on Indian Lives. Now, the difference between the New India Foundation and Indian Lives is that the New India Foundation was mostly working with first-time writers. So it was like yeah. Rukhani working with me. I was working with these first-time writers who had exciting ideas, who had done great research, who had extraordinary energy, enthusiasm, but yeah. didn't just know how to put it all together in the shape of a, you know, a, an effective a work of scholarship. It yeah. was well-written, yeah. well-argued, and not too long. So in mm. Indian Lives is slightly different because most of the writers are not first-time authors. This is, I think, mm. the fifth or sixth book. Uh, the first author in the series was uh, Patrick Olivelle, who is a much more distinguished yeah. scholar than me. I mean, I'm 65, he's in his 80s, and he's a colossal uh, historian of ancient India. So it's slightly different that it's more, here I'm acting more as a kind of a initiator rather than editor, so more curator, you know, I identify a, an established scholar, a distinguished scholar, and I say, hey, are you working on a biography? In Nico Slate, he was working on uh, Kamla Devi. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Chitalekha Zuchi's case, he was already working on, uh, on Sheikh Abdullah. In Patrick Oliver's case, he hadn't thought of a subject, but I said, Patrick, you know, you're a great historian of ancient India. Why don't you consider Ashoka? So here, it, it's, I mean, obviously, I have read the three books that have come in their series in manuscript form, and I provided whatever feedback I could. But my interventions have been much less than, shall we say, Rukun Azwani's interventions in my early work, or my own interventions uh, uh, in the work of first-time authors, you know, people who've since gone on to do wonderful work and have written many other books. Uh, so I think, uh, but yes, uh, Sanya, I would say that uh, what I'm doing now with Indian Lives and what I did previously with New India Foundation is paying my debts to the great editors who nurtured me when I was young. So I have to give a little bit back uh, to other scholars. Right. And if you can just walk us before I uh, move to Professor Slate, if you can just walk us through how you're going about picking these uh, these figures, because uh, it's it's no mean task to just to pick up. Uh, is there some method to this, or is this like a random selection of people? Well, it's not a very rigorous scientific method, nor is it a random selection. So first of all, I should say that uh, there are two or three uh, aspects to it which I should share with your viewers. First, I wanted writers uh, or books in the series to be properly paid. Uh, so I have got three 
visionary Indian philanthropists who are thanked in every volume uh, to donate upfront uh, a sum which amounts to 15, uh, 12 lakhs for every book, which is not an inconsiderable sum. It's about a little more than $15,000 even for someone like Nico teaching at American University. And this is independent of the royalties they will get, which Harper Collins or their foreign publisher will pay them. Because I think writing is hard work. It should be properly paid, you know, like any other profession. So I'm deeply grateful to these philanthropists. Then I uh, thought that uh, I would exclude some obvious people. So there will be no Gandhi in the series. There will be no Tagore in the series. There will be no Nehru. There will be no Savarkar. There will be no Mughal emperor. There will be no Akbar, uh, etc. Babar, because these are all well known and there are books written about them. And third, I wanted people who could use a life uh, who are properly trained historians, but also had a kind of some kind of sociological under broader sociological understanding. They were not popular writers, storytellers, anecdotalists. These were mm. scholars who could use a very mm. interesting, controversial life to portray a larger picture. I mean, through Kamla Devi, you know all about uh, yeah. uh, you know, India. I mean, and particularly yeah. you know the interaction between feminism, socialism, and nationalism. Through Sheikh Abdullah, yeah. you get to know so much about the complicated, tortured and still controversial history of modern Kashmir. Through Ashoka, you know, the whole world of ancient India and the Mauryan Empire unfolds. Uh, so I want to yeah. call it a bridge biography and history. Uh, and yeah. I have so about 20 have been commissioned so far. And my hope, Sanya, this is the last thing I'd say, and I would tell you this is really Nico's yeah. show, Nico should be talking. The last thing I'd say is I am now 65. So I hope in the next five or 10 years uh, to have 20 or 25 books in, published in the series. And then I will hand it over to a younger scholar who can take it forward into the future when I'm long dead. Because India has produced so many interesting characters that a series yeah. like lives in, typically, I mean, ideally should be 50 or 100 or 150 people, which each volume meeting the scholarly and literary standards of the books published so far. Moving to Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay now, I think you... Sir described her as um, I mentioned earlier as one of the greatest Indian women of modern times and uh, you've also written that perhaps only Tagore matched her in the range of multiple careers she uh, sort of had and you Professor Slate write that in terms of her international connections she was rivaled only by Nehru why do we know so little about this woman in India Professor Slate I'm happy to start first, but before I answer that excellent question, I just want to push back slightly on something that Ram said. He was very humble, which is typical for him, uh, but I would say that he went far beyond just identifying the authors for this. And he mentioned reading the manuscript, but his comments were extraordinarily helpful. And he's long been a champion of my work and the work of many other younger scholars. In fact, when I first came to know Kamala Devi myself, it was some 20 years ago when I was just beginning my dissertation research, and that is where I actually first met uh, Ram Guha in the archives in Delhi, where I was looking through Kamala Devi's papers and the papers of many other an Indian anti-colonial figures. And here I was, this very young, very ignorant scholar uh, coming out of the United States. I knew very little about Indian history. I was just starting to learn things. And not only was uh, Ram not put off by my ignorance, he was extraordinarily encouraging and supportive and has been throughout my entire career. So for me, when this opportunity came to write this biography, it was for me a blessing on two fronts. Uh, first, because I feel such a debt of gratitude to Ram Guha, and also because Kamala Devi has also been there from the very beginning of my own work uh, in, in the history of India. Let me come back to your question, Sanya. It's a very good one. Why is Kamala Devi not as well known as she should be? I think there are a couple reasons for this. One reason is that um, Kamala Devi's most influential political career happened before in Indian independence. Um, she was extraordinarily uh, well connected uh, with the Indian National Congress, with particularly the Congress Socialists. She was extraordinarily yeah. connected to the leading women's organization of the day, the All India Women's Conference. Um, she had a tremendous influence in that period post-independence, she continued to have remarkable influence, but it was focused primarily in the realm of arts and crafts. Now, one of the big surprises for me as a historian, and, and it shouldn't be a surprise, again, it just comes from my own ignorance at the outset of this project, 
I was quite struck by how her work in the arts and crafts field remained heavily political. It was deeply bound up with her vision for India's future in terms of uh, egalitarian democracy, in terms of um, economic equality. Um, her, her commitment to arts and crafts wasn't just about her love for the art, it was also very political. But I think part of why people don't know her as well as they should, particularly outside the arts and crafts world, because there, of course, anyone committed to arts and crafts, they still love and adore Kamala Devi. But outside of that field, I think many people don't recognize just how influential she was because she had that break in her career, unlike a figure, obviously, like Nehru, right, who is very important mm. before and after independence. Kamala Devi's life switches in, in a way that I think has limited uh, the way that she's understood. And the last thing I'll say briefly is just that I'm um, absolutely uh, convinced that uh, Kamala Devi was not only one of the most important Indian women of the 20th century, but also one of the most important global women. And, and there I am delighted that this uh, book is being published both in India, but also abroad, because hers is a story yeah. that needs to be read by people here in India, but also absolutely by people throughout the world, because she was, as you mentioned, one of the most well-traveled, globally connected figures in the history of modern India. And she had a tremendous impact, not just here in India, but also abroad. Yeah. And I think her story would be so valuable, uh, not just in India, as you said, but globally, because uh, specifically because of her understanding of feminism, it was so unique in some sense, because um, in the book, you say that she sort of resisted using the word feminist for herself, even though she advocated everything um, that one would normally associate with the word. And um, another thing that I, you write that I found very interesting is that she deployed the strategy of praising India, um, mm -hmm. ancient India, in order to challenge contemporary patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and she also had to be very careful of not offending men through her activism or political rhetoric. Now, these are sort of very interesting strategies. Can you unpack these strategies and her predicaments um, for us? Yes, there's a lot there. I'll do my best. So first, starting with the term feminism. I would argue that Kamala Devi is not especially unique in rejecting the term feminist as a Western import. There were many other sure. leading Indian women. Sarjini Naidu, for example, famously said, I am not a feminist. This was a typical argument, and for good reason. Um, the so-called deprivation of women or the oppression of women had, had often been used by imperialists, uh, uh, the American Catherine Mayo is a famous example in order to defend British imperialism and Western influence more broadly. So- uh, uh, Sati a, being a huge example. Yes, exactly, exactly. So Kamala yeah. is very aware of this and very um, focused on not feeding into these Western narratives that were pro-imperial, right? She's strongly anti-colonial, mm -hmm. but she's also very aware of the need to challenge patriarchy and sexism within India. So how do you do that at the same mm -hmm. time? How do you yeah. challenge India's problems while also not giving fodder to these Western imperialists? I think Kamala Devi is one of the most successful figures at doing that, both within India and also when she goes abroad. She very marvelously mm -hmm. says, yes, we have our problems and we're fighting them and we're confronting them. We need to do more. But the British imperial system is not the answer. And here's all of the reasons. Let me just say a little bit more about that term feminism. It's not just that it's a yeah. Western support and it is connected to these imperialist rhetorics. The other issue Kamala Devi does have is that from the outset, her vision of women's empowerment is deeply bound up with her sense for the other struggles that are close to her heart, her socialism, her opposition to uh, caste inequity, to religious majoritarianism, all of the, her, her opposition to white supremacy on a global stage. All of these struggles for Kamala Devi are equally important. And she doesn't like the idea that anyone would be narrow in their conception of what they're fighting for or who they're fighting with. And this comes to your last question about her relationship with her male colleagues. Kamala Devi yeah. um, spent much of her career working with women very closely. She was, as I mentioned, a leading figure in the All-India Women's Conference, but she was equally connected to many male colleagues and believed firmly that it's important for women to both have independent organizations, but also to be able to move freely and collaborate with men fighting for common causes. And that's actually what I think is most remarkable about her. You know, the fancy theoretical word for this if, among scholars is intersectional or intersectionality. It's just the idea that different kinds of oppression aren't separate, right? There isn't sexism yeah. here and imperialism over here, but these different forms of oppression intersect. 
Kamalarevi saw that sh more sharply than I think almost any other figure I've encountered. And then because of that, she was able to build coalitions in opposition to all of these different forms of oppression. Right. And if you can walk us through some of her relationships with her male colleagues, and um, of course, we can't talk about all of them, but if you can just um, tell our viewers a little bit about her um, very interesting relationship with Gandhi, for example, because she was Gandhian, but it's not as though um, she worshipped him uncritically, she would challenge him. Can you can you walk us through that relationship? Well, it's an honor and a pleasure, but also a bit intimidating to talk about Gandhi in the presence of uh, one of his leading biographers, but I'll do my best. And Ram, please correct me when I err. Um, I would say one of the things I most love about the relationship between Kamala Devi and Gandhi is that it reveals the degree to which both of them were able to change their minds, were able to debate and disagree, but still come together. As you said, Kamala Devi was certainly not a devotee of Gandhi. Um, she did not line up with all of his views, particularly uh, his views on you know, matters of diet or or dress, for example, but also many of his political views. One of the most dramatic moments in the book for me is when um, Gandhi uh, begins the famous salt march in the spring of 1930 with this very carefully selected group of some, if I recall correctly, 78 satyagrahis, all of whom are men. And his vision of the salt satyagraha, the larger protest, is one in which women will absolutely be included but in a relatively confined way. He, he wants women to focus on things that are less overtly confrontational, things like uh, boycotting or picketing liquor stores. Kamala Devi wants nothing to do with that. She wants the entire movement to be open to women to participate in all phases and stages. She's not alone in this. There are other uh, women that challenge Gandhi as well, but she's one of the most vocal who actually goes directly to Gandhi and says, this is something that needs to be changed. And to his credit, he changes it. Uh, it's one of many examples uh, that strike me as really exemplary for him. The ten of yours, though, how does she go about convincing him? Uh, well, for, I think part of it is just that she physically goes to the march and, and says, here I am. It's not men uh, uh, only anymore. So some of it is just showing up in presence, which is actually different from several of the other women that challenged him through letters or in other ways. That's part of it. But part of it is also that she's able to use his philosophy in order to assert the ability of women to actively participate, because Gandhi had long said that part of the brilliance of nonviolence uh, of Satyagraha as a method was that it was open to everyone. It wasn't just the you know strong men who could advance it. It was women. It was young people, old people. Everyone could participate. So she said, rightfully, uh, you pointed out that this is open to everyone, so let's let's make it open to everyone. Um, at the end of her life, I, I might argue that she's actually one of the uh, most interesting um, uh, figures to continue Gandhi's legacy into the post-independence yeah. period. There are, of course, many, many people that do this in a variety of ways, uh, but her com commitment to handicrafts, to working with one's hands, is a direct legacy of Gandhi, his focus on the charka and, and you know, hand handmade things, and also his focus on rural development was very close to Kamala Devi's heart. So even though they, they disagreed on many things over all of Kamala Devi's life, yeah. um, I, she's absolutely profoundly influenced by him, and their, their relationship is quite beautiful. The last thing, if we have time, I'll come back to you later, is just um, he involves himself in her personal life in a way that's complicated, but also, I think, uh, speaks to both um, his, his uh, sincere care for her and, and her sincere uh, appreciation for their relationship. So yeah. they, they have a, a personal relationship as well as a political one. Yeah. And, you know, coming to her personal life, um, she obviously did not have an easy personal life, even though, um, and I'll come to that later, she didn't like talking about um, her life uh, publicly as such, but she lost her father very early. She was married and also lost her husband by the age of 12. Um, she also chose to remarry someone um, out of her own choice. And later, she also decided to divorce uh, the, the same man. Um, how much do you think her political views were created by or even in response to her own life? Because uh, there's a very uh, interesting line in the book that you say, um, the freedom she sought for her country was also for herself. Mm -hmm. So what was that interaction between her personal and political life like? It's a, it's a powerful question, Sanya. Um, I would say that yes, 
absolutely Kamala Devi's political life is fed by her own personal struggles, most dramatically in the case of her commitment to women's rights. You see this from her childhood. When her father dies, um, her mother inherits much less than she might otherwise because of the patriarchal inheritance system at that time. Kamala Devi is married as a child. In her case, she's fortunate though, when her, her, her husband dies, um, her mother is already committed to women's empowerment, as is the uh, father of the of the boy, and that allows Kamala Devi the freedom to continue her education and eventually to remarry Harindranath Chattopadhyay, the great poet and, and actor. Um, as you said, Harindranath was um, a very dynamic and, and creative man, not a great husband, uh, had you know, many affairs and, and with many different figures, and eventually Kamala Devi does decide to divorce him. Now, here's where, I, I, in terms of her women's empowerment, you can see how her personal life, her childhood influences her politics, but it's actually really a circle uh, because it all gets bound up in very messy and complicated ways because um, when she chooses to divorce um, Harindranath, it's a, a point of real controversy uh, amongst many of her colleagues and peers. Nehru, not surprisingly, is very supportive. He tends to be more progressive about such things. Gandhi is uh, quite guarded, um, and Sarojini Naidu, uh, her, her sister-in-law, is quite upset about this decision. So there's a lot of tensions at play here that are uh, deeply troubling for Kamala Devi and complicate her political trajectory. Um, I think there's a solid argument to be made that she very well might have had more influence, for example, in the working committee of the Congress earlier if she had chosen not to divorce uh, Harindranath. But she chose to follow uh, her own spirit, which is something she always did. She was a very brave and courageous figure. And so even when her, her personal life complicates her politics, she still fights to stay true um, to, to who she is and, and who she wants to be. Now, this relates to something that I wanted to ask you that um, she, you write that she was very guarded about her personal life because um, she was aware of how it could be used as a weapon in the hands of her opponents. Um, could you, could you tell us how rumors or this kind of gossip about her personal life used against her politically and the cost that she had to pay for her personal life? Yes. Uh, well, I just mentioned Sarjini and I do yeah. uh, opposition to the divorce. Um, we have uh, a sort of paper trail showing that uh, Naidu reached out to Gandhi to express her uh, frustration, anger uh, with Kamala Devi's decision, and also that that decision, the decision to divorce, played a role in a larger conversation that involved a variety of other Congress figures about the, whether or not Kamala Devi should be asked to join the working committee. So you can see some direct lines and conversations at this point where her her divorce, which is a very public affair, is, you know, um, one of the first civil divorces in, in, in modern India. And here's where I try to be a careful scholar. I was tempted to say the first civil divorce, um, but I think it's always hard to say the first. You know, as soon as you say it, someone will find something else. So I, I prefer to say one of the, but it was certainly a very unusual thing, uh, and it drew quite a lot of attention. Now, as to the question of her privacy, this was a real struggle for me as a as a scholar. Um, in in uh, almost every one of my books, I've mentioned Kamala Devi. Uh, but all of those books have been focused on broader questions, and so I've only dealt with her her public life. This is a biography, and I knew at the outset I would have to engage her private life, but figuring out how to do so in a way that was respectful of her um, and also uh, was respectful of the fullness of who she was um, was a challenge. Her In her own memoir, for example, um, she mentions her husband, Hrnanath Chattopadhyay, a few times passingly as a colleague early on in her career, says nothing about the affair, says nothing about the divorce. Uh, her son also is not a figure in in the um, yeah. in that this was a, a I think a painful and complicated part of her life. She was also just in general a very private person. Um, mm. But my hope is that she um, would recognize uh, the importance of presenting the fullness of who she was, so that readers can better understand every aspect of what she did. We can't really understand her politics, her con contribution to the arts and crafts, if we don't understand the full remarkable life that she lived. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I do want to ask you this, that even now, um, 
in general the life and lifestyles of activists are usually a subject of a lot of um conversation and even ridicule if you come from a lot of privilege yourself mm. uh, then your uh, right to be an activist is questioned a lot and this um you you do mention about kamla devi as well that she faced something similar but you write that she saw no hypocrisy in fighting inequity while collecting an expansive wardrobe neither did she see a contradiction in embracing traditional women's fashion while challenging the ways tradition limited women uh do you see these as contradictions or do you just see this as her being absolutely unburdened by the weight of straight jacketed ideologies mm. more the latter than the former i mean i should note that although kamla devi is born to a fairly well off uh you know um chitrapur saraswat family for much of her life she lives fairly modestly um you know her right. own income is relatively small um she's definitely not living a luxurious life um and much of the anti colonial period well at least several years of it she spends in colonial jails much of it in in solitary confinement so hers was by no means an, an easy or luxurious life but yes um she did reject a certain gandhian austerity particularly when it came to fashion um and she did so i think on at least two different grounds one was uh just a deep love for beauty um one of my favorite quotes that i i have at the beginning of the book and then i come back to at the end is beauty be this is a kamala devi quote she says beauty is the soul of freedom and i think for her and this is a we you, you mentioned tagore earlier i think there's some overlap here with tagore it's a certain strand of recognizing that the aesthetic is not distinct or separate from freedom um that that the goal is not just to have political independence but the goal is also to live a life of of beauty broadly understood and this is something kamala devi pursued throughout her life it was a, a deep commitment that she had um i also think that she um saw fashion um and jewelry as a way to defend her own femininity um and her identity as an indian woman while also taking on all, all these other roles she was Uh, saying i can be um uh, a political activist i can be a social reformer but i can also be an indian woman and and uh, all of these identities mattered quite a bit to her so i i i i appreciate her um her rejection of a certain degree of austerity but i also think it's important to not play up too much her her luxurious lifestyle she aimed for a middle ground um which strikes me at least in our contemporary world as um you know all that we should expect from activists in my own view and not, not everyone is going to live the full austere life i mean if they do more power to them um but i think if we if we hold that this comes back to gandhi ji if we hold up a figure like gandhi as the only role model and 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 of course ignore all of the complexities of his life if we hold up the saintly figure the figure most often seen in the west um then what does that mean for all of us it means that we'll never have access to that kind of life right and i think kamala devi kamala devi is a different kind of hero she's a hero that reminds us that um all human beings are flawed that we all have our struggles and that if we are going to stay committed to fighting for justice over the long term we also need to stay committed to living lives of beauty and joy so i mean i, I what i gather from what you're saying is she was more real in that sense and uh correct me if i'm wrong uh, tagore and gandhi obviously had such um, massive although very friendly deep disagreements about so many things would it be correct to say that kamla devi in some way amalgamates uh, both gandhism and tagoreanism if i would call it so in some no ways? i like I, uh, i like that i like that uh, formulation very much uh, <laughs> i think and and she herself um sees uh a direct connection between the work that she's doing and the work that both Gandhi and Tagore did. Um one of the more moving passages in her memoir um as something I quote near the end of the book has to do with a a walk that she took with Tagore near the end of his life um in which they are talking about dreams and the role of dreams and um it, this is something she holds on to uh, throughout her entire life she comes back to many many years later Uh, both figures are very important to her and i think you're right to see uh, a sort of coming together or mixing of these different uh, philosophies and approaches 
there's something you write about her um, views on women having public careers. And mm. I find that so, so important because even though she would lay emphasis on public careers in modern education for women, um, she did feel that too much emphasis on public careers could blunt the importance of what many women did within the home. Um, I think this is such an important, uh, uh, this is such an important sort of view that we we don't um, talk about enough. Can you explain? Uh, can, can you explain where she was coming from and what, according to her, according to you, was at risk for her if women, there was too much emphasis on women's public careers? Yes, yes. Um, I very much appreciate the question. As you said, um, she wants to ensure that women have the freedom and the opportunity to pursue whatever career they're called to. But she also does not want to denigrate at all the work that many women have done traditionally within the home, whether uh, cooking, caring for children, etc. And I actually find this quite remarkable because it comes back to her own personal life. Um, in some ways, Kamala Devi was a, a working mother. I say in some ways because um, she was often forced to rely on the help of others, whether during her times of imprisonment or when she was traveling abroad. Um, but if you look at the large scale, certainly she had to balance her commitments as a mother with the work that she was doing outside of the home. Um, and she was very, very uh, aware of the importance of both um, these lines of, of work. I think if, if she was alive today, she would absolutely um, embrace the uh, increasing and opening up opportunities for women in all ranges of society, but also would continue to insist that we value the work of all people. Um, the work that women did. This comes back to Gandhi as well, right? The, the work that is done with one's hands is just as important as the work that is done in the office or somewhere else. All of these forms of labor matter, and they mattered very deeply to Kamala Devi. Yeah. It was uh, in as early as the 1920s when she was talking about marital rape. It's mm. still not criminalized in India and in so many parts of the world. Um, how was she able to take these kind of positions and within the Congress, uh, was she facing opposition for taking views, uh, for, for taking stats like these? Because of course the Congress had a lot of conservatives within its fold as well. Yes, uh, well, so there's two parts to your question and it's a very important one, sort of what gave her the, the space to assert these views and then how did, did those assertions play out in terms of her relationship with Congress more broadly? Um, in terms of the space, I think uh, I think some of it is that uh, she came into the public sphere as a very young uh, woman uh, in her twenties. Um, her first real public act was um, well after her her brief career in in theater and drama, which maybe we'll come back to. She had so many different lives; it's hard to cover it all. Yeah. But the, her her first public political act was running for the legislative assembly. Um, if she had won, she would have been the first woman yeah. to have such a position. She ends up losing, but that's not too surprising, given that she's running against the established Congress candidate. Um, she's facing, of course, the the huge mountain of of patriarchy. Um, but I think, to some degree, her outsider status, the fact that she's coming into um, politics as a young woman who's already made a very controversial personal choice to remarry across the lines of caste and region, um, allows her to, to embrace that sense of being uh, being different, being an outsider, being, if you will, a radical. This is something that she'll hold on to throughout her life. Um, and I think it, it comes in part from her early experiences in politics. As to how it played out, perhaps the most interesting figure to look at here is uh, Sardar uh, Vallabhai Patel, um, right? Yeah. Who's, uh, in some ways, the most influential of the more conservative figures within the within the Congress. Um, and Kamala Devi has some very fiery clashes with Patel, both in, in private and in public. Um, they, they, there's, uh, and and many, much of it does have to do with questions of gender and sexuality. Um, Kamala Devi is a fiery spokesperson for the younger generations, for those who are saying, we need to change these old ways, we need to fight back. And Patel is uh, a voice for uh, conservatism on this front. But just as with Gandhi, one of the most remarkable things here is that they fight and they challenge each other, and then they find their way to come back together. It's Patel who helps um, uh, welcome Kamala Devi into her role as one of the uh, leading organizers of the um, 
uh, women's uh, branch of social reformers in the in the early 1940s. There's a special camp that's set up to train women who will go out and help both carry forward the, the sort of Gandhian constructive message, but also the Congress political message. And Patel is warmly um, enthusiastic with Kamaladevi's leadership in that regard. Um, they have, um, you know, many private conversations in later in that in the sort of late 30s and 40s that demonstrate that those clashes did not prove an unbridgeable divide between them. They were able to come together later. And if I can, let me just say something briefly. This Ram mentioned earlier that part of the goal of this series is to have books that speak both to a person's life, but also to broader histories. Yeah. This is one yeah. of the things that I found most remarkable about the story of modern India through the lens of Kamla Devi. I think it's one of the great strengths of the freedom struggle that we all need to continue to cultivate wherever we are in the United States these days, it's very urgently needed, is the ability to forge a broad coalition across a variety of divides in, in support of a larger struggle for democracy. Um, this is something Kamala Devi was deeply involved in, forging ties and alliances with a range of figures with whom she could disagree passionately on many subjects, but still recognize in the end of the day, we're fighting for the same thing. So we're gonna disagree, We'll fight things out. Another great example, actually, where she clashes with the conservatives is on uh, the the prince, the so-called princely states. Kamala Devi is one of the fiercest opponents of autocracy uh, in the in the various princely yeah. states, in part because of her own upbringing and her experiences in uh, Madras state this is, uh, and uh, and Mysore rather. Um, these are um, these are all issues where Kamala Devi fights hard against others helps move the Congress in a certain direction, but it's a messy democratic process where coalitions are being formed and reformed and people are fighting things out. This is part of the brilliance of, of Indian democracy. And, and it's a brilliance that I think, you know, everyone in the world needs to reclaim right now, right? Because there are lots of forces at play that require people across the broad spectrum of those who are pro-democratic to come together and say, we might disagree on X, Y, and Z, but we need to find ways to work together in order to advance the larger struggle. Yeah, you know, there are so many more things to be unpacked in this book, but I have to ask a concluding question to you, to both you, Professor Slate and uh, Mr. Guha. Uh, if you can just tell us what a biographer's relationship with the, their subject is once the book is over. Does Kamla Devi, for example, continue to live with you now that the book is done and it will be launched soon? What will your relationship be uh, with her like now? And I'll come, I, I'd want to ask you that question as well, Mr. Guha. Well, I'm happy to go first. I think Ram has uh, such a depth of experience on this. So I, I will give you the last word. Let me just say, I certainly hope so. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, I came to Kamala Devi some 20 years ago when I was working on my PhD dissertation, and she's shown up in almost every book I've published since then, one of which I dedicated to her and an African-American activist. Um, she's been a tremendous inspiration for me. And I, I one small personal thing I didn't mention earlier, when I came to India that first time and first met Ram in the archives, I brought my mother with me. Um, and I did so for a variety of reasons, one of which was that my, my older brother had recently passed away. My mother was deep in grief and uh, needed uh, to be very close to me, but also needed uh, a, a place to regain her commitment to life. And coming to India was a, a real lifesaver for her. And she also worked in the Kamala Devi archives with me. And I found deep meaning in this because... Um, like Kamala Devi, my mother is a very brave and courageous woman who didn't always have the best choice in husbands. Um, and so she uh, she also ended up being a single mother like Kamala Devi, raising my brother and me on her own. Um, so when I, when I write about Kamala Devi, I'm writing about a figure I deeply admire on the political front, but also someone who reminds me in, in many very positive and powerful ways of my own mother. So I hope she stays with me for the rest of my life. I certainly do. Uh, but Ram, please. Uh, so, uh, Sonia, I have, that's a wonderful question. I have written two biographies, um, more recently of Gandhi, but I won't talk about Gandhi. And the first is of a figure uh, sort of comparable to Kamala Devi, a fascinating character who was, uh, did many things, uh, but was is not as celebrated as Gandhi or Ambedkar or Tagore or Nehru, or, namely Verrier Elvin. And um, I was, you know, I owned a 
like Nico and Kamla Devi, I had a long engagement with Elvin. It was by reading Elvin I moved from <coughs> economics to sociology and then to history. And then I spent many years writing a life of Elvin, which is described in my memoir, The Cooking of Books. But what has stayed with me? You know, it's 25 years since my biography of Elvin was published. But some things have stayed with me. What is, um, uh, which I learned from Elvin and writing Elvin's life. The first is, um, you could say sociological, that Adivasis have gained least and lost most from 75 odd years of Indian independence. You know, they've been discriminated against economically, socially, politically. And while they're not the only discriminated groups, you of course have Dalits, women and my and uh, religious minorities, particularly Muslims, the three other groups that are discriminated against. Those other three groups, marginalized groups, have vocal and articulate advocates. And the Adivasis even now are largely invisible in the media and in public debate. So that's one part, which is why I still occasionally write about, you know, Adivasi issues. The second is um, more literary, that historians and anthropologists unlike economists and mathematicians, can and must write for a wider audience. If you're a physicist or a mathematician or a philosopher, uh, to communicate the depth and, depth and subtlety and originality of your research, you have to use a certain technical language. You know, I don't know what your scientific background is, but probably it's similar to Nico's and mine. I'm a physicist. I can't communicate the, the real richness of her uh, findings yeah. to you. But a historian and an anthropologist can. History mm -hmm. and anthropology are branches of literature as well as social science. So one must not mm -hmm. use excessive jargon, must not try and communicate widely. Mm -hmm. And so that's the second thing I've learned from Erwin. The third thing, of course, is a kind of, which comes from the Adivasi aspect and the fact that Adivasi is lived close to forests, is an interest in nature and ecology and biological diversity. And I've just finished a book mm -hmm. on the history of Indian environmentalism, where after many years I've returned to Elvin and what he had to say about nature and forests and, and the diversity of non-human life. And the fourth uh, is, um, is something Kamala Rebi would have recognized, and which is linked to some of the questions you've asked, Nico, is that, uh, you know, uh, you have to build bridges. So, of course, uh, caste discrimination has to be fought principally and most directly and most vigorously, vigorously by Dalits and other oppressed castes. But Brahmins who are self-aware, who go beyond their caste identification and recognize the injustice that Brahmins have visited on Dalits, uh, must yeah. also be welcome. You know, it's not like, you know what activists are like. Yeah, you know, course, men can't speak for women, uh, you know, Brahmins can't speak for Dalits. And Elwin, here was Elwin, an Englishman, who wrote so beautifully about Adivasi society, who became an Indian citizen who knew more about this country than you know, many, many of us. So these kind of artificial boundaries where identity is predominant and you believe people mm -hmm. cannot transgress their identity. A rich person can never empathize with a poor person. A Brahmin has no idea about how a Dalit suffers. Mm -hmm. a can never have a full mm -hmm. idea. A man mm -hmm. can never have a full understanding of, of patriarchy and its multifarious and awful effects. But if he is mm -hmm. willing to be open, aware, engaged yeah. with families of all kinds, he can at least become much less patriarchal. So I think these are some of the things that my life with Elwin, which ended formally 25 years ago, you know, he, so I think that's what happens, you know, so I think I, in, in that sense, if you, you see, because Sanya, what, when you write a biography uh, of a, of a interesting middle range figure, you know, not a Churchill, not a Mandela, not a Gandhi, not an Ambedkar, mm. but a Kamla Devi or a very Elwin. Uh, it's actually in some ways an act of self-effacement of uh, suppressing your own ego and saying, I, Nico Slate, for six or eight or ten years, will totally devote myself to understanding somebody else. You know, if you're writing about Gandhi, Gandhi is famous and Mandela is famous, so you can get some of the reflected glory. But if you write an interesting yeah. minor figure, it's actually a True. It, it's that you're also involved in their lives. You know, you're willing to spend five, seven years uh, devoted to understanding them more deeply. And even when your book is out, like Nico's book is out, uh, you know, traces of what they meant to you will remain for the rest of your life.
True. That that's that's so fascinating. Um, I, I I have to admit, I actually ended up reading this book in just two days. So it's it's actually that good. And as you said, it has absolutely no jargon. It's so easy to read. So I highly recommend this to our viewers. And this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Slade. Thank you so much, Mr. Guha. Thank you, Thank you, Sanya. Thank you very much. Thank you.